Right. Well, uh, my name's Chris Squire, and I'm a charlatan. I'm standing here in front of you, you know, the expert in a room full of people who, you know, the, the combined expertise in this room is overwhelming, isn't it? You all know exactly what you're doing, really, in, in, in lots of ways. So what else have I got to, um, got to say on the matter? <coughs> well, humour me just for a moment, if you would. Um, I've got a uh, simple bit of... I don't know how many of you are office jockeys, but you might know these from uh, you know, various sizes in here. Just pass that amongst you. And have a guess at how many items there are in that. You can count them, but it'll take you too long, I think. Oh, Just pass it around. Think how many's in there and write down that number. That would be very good. 250. 250. And. Okay. Do, have I missed anyone else who wants to go at this? Sorry. I've only got one more space. Okay. Um, so you can see there's 21 things. Uh, the average is uh, 359. The actual is, is 273. So it's interesting, very interesting. OK, the reason I did this will come clear in just a second. But um, it, it's not bad. It's not bad. We're sort of, you know, 75 out or something like that. <coughs> But Francis Galton, uh, he was a child genius, prodigy. Uh, he was related to Charles Darwin. Um, he wrote a book, Hereditary Genius. Uh, he actually coined the term eugenics. He believed, really, that there was uh, people, you know, good... It means good born, well born. So people who, are, you know, there's a certain class of people who are well born, who are destined to lead and be perfect people. Uh, so that's what he was um, setting out in his, in his book, really. But one day he went to a country fair where there was an intriguing contest. There was an ox that was... Um, <clears throat> there was a competition, really. People had to guess the weight of the ox when it was killed and prepared. And these were simple country folk, an everyday story. Uh, some, were, some were farmers, some weren't, you know, all sorts of people. Anyone who would go to a fair, really. A uh, whole mix of people were there, of course. But what he did is he, he got all the betting slips, and I think 800 people actually put money on it. So actually they invested in, in trying to win something. In fact, I think win the meat. Um, <clears throat> and he was trying to prove, really, that they'd be well out. They'd be completely rubbish at it because um, they're just en everyday people. They know nothing. And uh, so the bull... The, the mean average guess out of all those people was 1197 pounds and actually the weight was whoops here we go 1198 so they were a bit closer than we were but um but actually the the mean guess of you guys was pretty close really in, in comparison to some of the guesses we had from some of you uh, who will remain nameless <laughs> <laughs> that was my mistake. He wouldn't go up the stairs and uh, didn't fancy the lift. So, so that's really uh, the thesis of what I'm talking about, really. The fact that there's sort of... Um, oh, so he, he actually came to... Because of that, he came to change his mind. Because he said, the results seem more credible to the trustworthiness of a democratic judgment than might have been expected. So he actually used scientific rigour, really, to change his mind. And um, it's become really known as this wisdom of crowds, this idea. And a more modern example, the submarine, it's American Scorpio, Scorpion, I think it's called, nuclear-powered submarine that um, disappeared one day, suddenly, somewhere off the Azores. No one, they had a sort of last fixing, but they didn't really know how many days it had been travelling. It was about four days before they submerged out of, out of communication. They didn't know quite which direction it was going in. 
I didn't know how to find it. So they assembled a panel of experts from a range of fields, really. So some were nautical people, salvage people, fishermen, trawlermen, whatever. Um, and they got them to bet where they thought it would be. And uh, the story is that it was found 300 metres from where they actually found it. They, they used this calculation, which is probably where you went wrong. You didn't use the right um, algorithm to find out how many things were in there. But there is a probability of working out. Um, but that, that, was the, that was the view of it when they found it. it lost 199 people. So <clears throat> this idea of crowdsourcing was first coined, really, by this journalist. And it's used a lot in business, of course. The idea that instead of hiring experts, companies can sort of turn things over to the masses and let them do the work for you. And it, and it can be applied in lots of different ways. Um, this idea of a collective intelligence, so using a crowd to solve a complex problem, like finding a submarine. But it also can be used, of course, in creation of coming up with or finding people with talents and, and connections that you, you want to make. It can be used kind of voting, and I suppose we might think of that in terms of feedback in some way, in terms of, of giving us responses to how, how things are going across. And of course, for funding, people are using it in that way, Kickstarter and, and We Did This, kind of can raise quite a lot of money for people's projects and things like that. But one more example, sort of Wikipedia, this is the, you know, the epitome of it really, is it's now the sixth most visited destination on the internet, apparently. Um, 15 times larger than Encyclopedia Britannica, you know. It's beginning to follow the, the old bell curve, really, the number of articles, you know, billions of hits. Of course, it's vulnerable, there's mistakes in it and things like that, but they've done comparisons with Encyclopedia Britannica, and actually, the errors aren't that much different than you find in a sort of expert written documents. Although it can be more poorly structured and badly written. But um, it's not as bad as people often say it is, really. Of course, you have to verify things. But, uh <coughs> but this is other idea. This, this is the Mechanical Turk, which was a chess-playing automaton, which went around the courts of, of Europe, really, and stunned people, because it could beat people at chess, this robotic figure. Of course, it's all a sham. Inside was a little guy <laughs> who's a very good chess player who could actually beat anyone who, and with magnets and you know, mechanical levers, they could mimic a robot. But um, there's now this mechanical Turk, the Amazon um, idea, really, that is in beta at the moment, I think. It's artificial, artificial intelligence. So the idea is you, you put it out to the public, really. You, get, you make an offer, and anyone can respond and, and be the kind of home workers, really, to lots of, lots of different things. So you can make money. You, you find a task you want to do, you do the work, and you earn the money. For organisations, they fund an account, they load up their tasks, and they wait for the results to come back. So some of them are very simple things. This is copying a business card into a database. And you can see you get um, two cents for each business card you, you accurately put across. Pretty boring work for two cents. But you can do it at home, you can do it in your own time, you can pick and choose, this. you can grade up and go do more. You know, I think NASA now is offering more complicated things to crunch you know, real, real tasks. But of course, it's also been used in a creative world. This is uh, Aaron Koblin, who had this thing. Again, he's paying two cents for every left facing sheep that is contributed to this artwork. Um, and you can click on any of these and you can see them being drawn there. And it's about a collaborative artwork, really. It's a, and it's, it's become a kind of a, a place to, to visit and, and, see, and see the variety and the similarities, I suppose. 10,000 sheep created that way. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's another one. This is um, uh, music. Well, no, this, this is, uh, sorry, uh, yes, yeah, swarm sketch. And you, you work collaboratively to respond to a title, a different title every 24 hours. And uh, all there's things like this, uh, Day in the Life, which is um, hundreds of people contributed video to, to, and it was made up and edited together to make one, one piece. 
of course, we all live in a sort of open source world as well. There are alternatives to lots of bits of software that people are out there uh, providing. There's communities of people creating software that's free to use. And there's a kind of an expectation, really, that anything that's created is, is free as well. So, so the idea as well is this Creative Commons license, so that we're not too precious about ideas. Actually, we're sharing a community of ideas. Um, but you have to really understand, I think, if you're asking uh, for collaboration, it seems, you know, what inspires people to participate? You have to kind of get inside a little bit what would motivate people to do it. You know, they're real people with real motivations. So um, are they after money, recognition, a chance to impress their peers, some other kind of connections? There's all sorts of reasons that could be. But I think the more you can understand and think it through, the better chance you get. Of course, you've got to be careful with these things. It, you've got to set some pretty clear <coughs> boundaries and ways of dealing with uh, things because it can be hijacked quite easily, this sort of digital town hall thing here. I think there was, there's a worry as well about uh, like the uh, YouGov polls, people wanting to vote for hanging and things like that. So you have to be you know, kind of constrained, really, or put some rules to what you want. There's also sort of... Vested interest in practical jokers, you know, as a, a group. Yeah, crowdsourcing a concert tour for Justin Bieber, uh, sending him to North Korea. So that didn't work for them. <laughs> but, but one of the dangers, I suppose, is this, this group think that um, actually you can be w working with a bigger group, but it, if everybody is, is talking to each other all the time. Everyone can have the same idea, really, and, and people can't, or are kind of afraid, really, to challenge it or to come up with an alternative. So sometimes a bit of conflict is good or a bit of uh, distance between things is good as well. So this idea that um, a desire for harmony will bring people into line. But really, um, these things aren't... Um, it's not like voting for what you want. I think the times when it works well in, in terms of ideas generation and things... It, it's about what what you expect will happen, or what you you, you know. It's it's, uh, it's like where you think the submarine will be, rather than where you want it to be in its broadest. So respect these diverse opinions, um, independence, people not not being swayed by other people, decentralized, and and also you have to aggregate things and pull uh, pull things together. So all these ideas sound great, but there's a big cost really in time of of managing it and organizing it and, and dealing with it. So it's not free, but uh, it, it is uh, valuable. So this is from We Did This, and, and they, there's some interesting things they're talking about on there. It's a, it's a kind of way of funding arts projects. So it's sort of saying, you know, pitch to your most likely contributor. You're not going to get mystery benefactors sort of rolling up with <coughs> billions of pounds. But they're more likely to if you've already got a community of people who are kind of around what you're doing. So really target those people. Um, make it achievable. Get something which, is, which you can really get to. Give rewards. I think on this scheme, really, everybody who contributes gets something. So you can make a personal little something that they get back in return. And, and that's what I mean about the rewards for contributing. Um, <coughs> Those who get to 25%, they say, quite quickly, are much more likely to reach their target. So get going with a good bit of momentum. You know, hit friends and family. Um, and make it easy for the press to pick up on what you're doing. Tell a good story. And uh, make those connections work, really. Make, uh, make people who've been contributing part of the story, part of the, the family. But, as I say, I'm really only here uh, as, a, as a focus, hopefully, because I know you all have the, the genius and the ideas within you. So what I really wanted to do was to break up into smaller groups and to, to really try and share some of the things that you think are going to work. So, again, it's not what you'd like to see happening, but what you think will be most useful. This is, as we were hearing, really, you know, this is... Infant technology, you know, the way we can connect with people, the way uh, communities can be you know, virtual and not, not uh, geographic. 
So there's lots of opportunities for, for that whole side. There's opportunities for, for engaging with people in different ways. So um, if we can get into sort of groups of, of five or six, that would be good. And uh, we'll, we can have a bit of a chance then to, uh, to pick out some of those, some of those <coughs> ideas.